I am so excited to introduce to you our speaker, Lauren Arnellis. I have been following Lauren's work for many years. Lauren is a longtime animal rights activist since 1987 and is the founder and senior program director of the Food Empowerment Project. Food Empowerment Project is a vegan food justice nonprofit that promotes veganism, champions the rights of farm workers, highlights the lack of access to healthy food in black and brown communities, and raises awareness about the worst forms of enslavement, including child labor and the chocolate industry. You can watch Lauren's TEDx talk entitled The Power of Our Food Choices, which is in the link. And you can learn more about the Food Empowerment Project, FEP's work at foodispower.org. Um, I heard Lauren speak uh, many years ago at an animal rights conference. And at the time, Lauren was one of the few people in the AR movement discussing our food choices from a multi-dimensional perspective. Lauren, thank you for your work and thank you for being with us this evening. We are so excited to have you. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you to start. Cool. Thank you, Kim. And thank you to Veg Michigan for having me. And Kim, I know Kim's name we, uh, is a longtime activist as well. I just know that she does a lot of good work. So it's very exciting to, to be a part of her new endeavor here. Um, with Veg Michigan and really excited to meet all of you as well. Um, I just want to start by acknowledging that I am presenting on stolen land, um, the land um, rightfully belonging to the Chumash people. Um, and so it's always important to me to honor and respect whose land I'm on, recognizing that this is land that was taken from them, um, and also recognizing importantly that the Chumash are still here in our community and still um, fighting for the planet and for their communities. Um, so I honor their elders and their, and as well as um, the current elders. Um, so with that, I'm going to share my screen. And go to my presentation. So um, again, thank you for having me. I just wanted to start out a little bit um, and talking about like who I am, as Kim mentioned, you know, I've been doing animal rights work since 1987 when I was in high school. Um, I grew up in Texas, so I actually started the first animal rights group at a high school in Texas, um, and I went vegan in 1988, and all of this was because simply I cared about animals, that I, growing up in Texas, would see cows in the field and just didn't want to be responsible for why that mom didn't come home one day or why the baby didn't come home one day. I didn't want to be responsible for taking their life. Um, but also as a very proud Hicanix, meaning I, I am Mexican, but I had the X at the beginning to honor my indigenous ancestors, as well as the X at the end to um, basically be in alignment with and, and solidarity with our trans friends. Um, but also kind of like a thumbs down to patriarchy because the Spanish language is very patriarchal. So that's how I identify myself. And as being, you know, somebody who was raised Mexican, um, very much in tune with the farm worker issue. Um, it was something that my mom taught me at a very young age about the great boycott. Um, I'm also somebody who grew up with, um, you know, not a lot of access to, to money, um, and, um, you know, getting food was always a challenge for us. It was something that, you know, sometimes it would be what people brought us um, to be able to eat. You know, it wasn't really a choice. I went vegetarian for the first time when I was like 13, but I couldn't stick with it. I had to eat what people brought us. And so it's always been very important to me to recognize, even though people may want to stop consuming animals, it may not always be easy for them to do so. Um, so again, having done animal rights since 1987, I was often confronted with people who didn't understand the importance of human rights. And I know that may sound weird to some of the people here, but it's true. Animal rights people told me I was hurting the animals when I would talk about um, farm worker justice issues, or when I talked about what I'll talk about today as well, which is slavery in the chocolate industry. And so I started Food Empowerment Project after I spoke at the World Social Forum in Caracas, Venezuela. And when I went there, I spoke basically about connecting the issues of corporate animal agriculture, how they harm non-human animals, how they harm communities, how they um, impact the environment, just everything about it and was met with people saying, well, who's doing something about it? And so that's kind of where some of the spark for Food Empowerment Project came from, is that I wanted to create an organization that saw that these issues were 
all important. And it wasn't a matter of um, this one's more important than the other, that we need to look at these issues as connected. And we needed to be able to say that these issues um, merit us working together. Instead of seeing each other as separate, we see the connectedness and then we're stronger. We're stronger to be able to, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, push that art towards justice. So it's really important that to me that we link these issues and we show them how they are connected. So I'm just going to start quickly with something. If you're part of Edge Michigan, you know, but as you hear me talk, I think it's important for me to reinforce this part of Food Empowerment Project. And that is that we are a vegan organization and we are a vegan organization for the animals. Um, this is my bunny Benito. He's actually named after the first indigenous president of Mexico, Benito Juarez. So his name is Bonito. And um, for all those Bad Bunny fans, I know that Benito means something else to you, um, Alejandra. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, it's just simply the fact that Benito has a right to his own body without worrying about somebody wanting to eat him. He has a right to his fur without somebody wanting to wear him. He has a right to his eyes without somebody trying to test um, cosmetics on him. He has a right to his own life and his own being. He's an individual. And if you hear noises in the background, that's him being sassy back there. But he is full of life and full of character as so many, as Willie, as all non-human animals are. And so they have a right to their own being um, without influence by us. And again, he was actually found outside on the, the streets of San Jose, California, because he was dumped as uh, a you know an Easter gift. So again... Benito, like all non-human animals, they have a right to their own being without um, worrying about somebody else wanting to harm or exploit them. So, um, and I always just want to touch on at least, I do not know why this is not letting me go to the next slide. Um, hmm. Let me see what's happening. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the dairy industry. Um, I'll, uh, if you're part of Edge Michigan, you probably already know the cruelties inherent in this industry, but I always think it's important to focus a little bit on the things that people don't stop to think about a lot when we talk about dairy. And that, of course, is that no matter what, um, the mama cow is forced to continuously pre be pregnant because that's the only way in which she can produce what's called appreciable amounts of milk um, for, for to be sold commercially. Um, her babies are taken away from her after birth, sometimes immediately, sometimes it might take some time, um, but not maybe a couple hours. Um, I have personally seen at a auction house in Petaluma, California, a baby calf being auctioned off where he was such a baby that his umbilical cord was still wet. Um, in California, which we are the number one dairy producing state, you have um, the, the female calves kept in crates really small where they can't turn around. Sometimes they're chained by the neck. Sometimes they're in these tiny igloos where if one of them knocks over in the hot California Central Valley, if one of the calves knocks over their water bowl or their food bowl, they die. They die because the, nobody is coming around as we know these farms are. And also that it doesn't really matter how big or how small the farms are, because at the end of the day, the dairy is wanting to sell the milk and they do not see that milk as intended for their baby. They see that milk as intended for human consumption. So like all the industry, the industry does not care about the well-being of these animals. They are, you know, slaughtering them. There's no such thing as humane slaughter, no such thing as humane meat or eggs. Because um, at the end of the day, these animals have parts of their bodies cut off um, and things are being done to them to basically enhance profit, not take care of any, any other part of the system. So Food Empowerment Project has um, some guides we created and we created them to honor um, the people who make up the organization. So as a Hicanix, being Mexican, um, it was very important for me to create a recipe page that included lots of recipes of Mexican food that are vegan. Um, and that website is available in English and in Spanish. My former colleague is Filipina. So we did one to honor her roots being a Filipina. That website is available in English and Tagalog. 
also one of our, our longest um, board members um, and actually our first intern is Lao. And so um, we created vegan Lao food, um, which is available in English and Lao, again, to honor her roots. And all of this is being done, not only to share how delicious our food is when it's vegan, um, but also for us to share within our community, to show them how delicious our food can be and is without the suffering of non-human animals. We also have all of these in booklet form. So we have vegan Mexican food in English and in Spanish, full of recipes, vegan Lao food, and just in English, um, vegan Filipino food in English and Tagalog. And all of these are recipe booklets. Um, and if anybody wants one, feel free to email us or follow up and say you attended this talk and we'd be happy to mail them out to you. So the next issue I wanna talk about is environmental racism. And typically I ask people, raise your hand um, if you've heard of environmental racism. But in case you haven't, environmental racism is when um, a certain portion of the population, black, brown, and indigenous are more impacted by negative pollutants than any other community. So Michigan is absolutely one of the places where this exists so strongly. Many of us are familiar what's happened in Flint with the water, but it also means toxic chemicals in the air, right? It means where your truck depots or your ports are, um, the, the bridge that connects Michigan to Canada, how widely that's used. And so there's a lot of environmental racism and injustice taking place in Michigan. And I hope that that's something that you'll try to be more aware of because there probably are things that you can do to help those communities. Again, primarily black, brown and indigenous communities being the most impacted. But when we talk about environmental racism, it's also really important as well to us to talk about where our food is coming from and how our food is also impacting the health of black and brown and indigenous communities. So in California, again, number one dairy producing state, we have some of the largest farms in the country um, where cows are being raised to produce milk. You have some farms, I think this farm is either, and I'm so bad with numbers, so I apologize y'all. It's either 17,000 or 27,000 cows at this facility. Um, and when you consider that one dairy cow produces 120 pounds of wet manure a day, and you multiply that, again, bad at numbers, but if you even take a small amount, that is a tremendous amount of waste being produced. And as you know, there's no sewer facility, waste treatment plant taking, taking care of this. So here in California, the vast majority who are being impacted by these dairy farms is the Latinx community. And here you have some of the highest rates of asthma in the country due to the dairy industry. Now, in North Carolina, you have a similar situation there. It's primarily Black and Indigenous communities that are impacted by the pig farms there. And here, the pig farms, I don't know, I've investigated pig farms, and the smell is something that is the most inexplicable, like I can't even tell you how bad the smell is. What I can tell you is that I had to shower at least three times to get the smell out of my skin and my hair. Um, but you have people living in these communities who um, suffer from nosebleeds and headaches because of the smell. Um, they, they, they have like sprinklers to get rid of some of this uh, manure that that the, the color looks like not even anything that's in nature that the community is then having go into their air again. Um, you also have the fact that um, people who live here can't have their windows open in the summertime because the flies are so bad that they can't, you know, can't really sell their property. Their property is almost worthless because nobody's going to want to move into these facilities. And again, these are primarily Black and Indigenous communities that are imp impacted by this form of environmental racism. Now, when we talk about environmental races, I'm going to shift another, there's two other ways that Food Empowerment Project looks at environmental racism and its impacts. I don't know why this happens all of a sudden. Okay. The other one is the impact of farm workers, because the vast majority of farm workers in our country are Latinx. Again, a form of environmental racism when negative pollutants are impacting primarily one community. Now, here you have investigations that have taken place in Michigan talking about what's happened. And when Alejandra and I put this presentation together, we wanted to make sure, because this is one of the most popular reported cases was when Walmart 
was caught having children as young as five years old picking blueberries in Michigan for their company. But a lawsuit just came out this week, actually on June 12th, reporting that 30 farm workers are part of a lawsuit in Michigan because of this. And I hope you can digest what I'm talking about here. You have 30 people who were working in North Carolina. They were woken up in the middle of the night and trucked over to Michigan to where they would be forced to live in a house, 30 people living in a house with two, two bathrooms and three bedrooms and no furniture. That is what we put farm workers through in this country. We treat them as if they are commodities. We treat them as if they're worthless. And as an organization like Food Empowerment Project, we want people to go to eat more produce, right? We want people to not consume non-human animals. So what we say is we can't just say you know, slaughterhouse workers are treated bad, factory farm workers are treated bad. We have to take some responsibility for how the workers who produce our food are treated as well. So at Food Empowerment Project, again, you know, we're based in California. We are a national organization, but the vast majority of produce in the U.S. comes from California. And here, even though we might think, and in some ways, absolutely, California is very enlightened, but when it comes to farm workers, we still have a long way to go. You have farm workers in California who are essentially um, unhoused members of our community. They live in cardboard boxes. They live, you know, on the creeks. Um, they live in the back of their pickup trucks because they are not being paid enough to be able to put a roof over their head. They also many times can't even afford the food that it is that they're picking. Uh, sexual harassment is rampant in the fields. Again, you have child labor going on, right? The agricultural, um, the agricultural industry has a foothold on child labor in California, actually across the country, where they get away with saying children are allowed to work with their parents, right? But the reality is, is they may be working with their parents, but the law was talking about children working with their parents on the farm that their parents own, not some corporate farm, but that's a loophole that they've been able to work through for generations now. Do not know why. Okay. Again, you also have the living conditions, which I've talked about, the working conditions. Again, they work in extreme temperatures. It doesn't matter how hot it is how windy it is. Again, in California, although you've heard about our rains, when we were going through that really serious um, uh, drought, they were having a lot of respiratory problems because of the dust being created, because the earth was so dusty. They would need to be wearing handkerchiefs to protect their respiratory system. Now, when we had these rains going on, they were still forced to work in these torrential downpours. And in fact, when they weren't able to work, again, it's not as if they have some type of payment system where it's like, okay, you couldn't work because of mother nature, which you couldn't help, you're still gonna get paid. They don't get paid. When you talk about their payment, many of them are paid by how much they pick, right? So if you're an older farm worker, you're not able to work as fast as the younger ones. Plus, if you've been doing this for a long time, your body hurts, your body aches, because if you've seen in the images I presented, a lot of times they're hunched over. So sometimes they're literally paid by how much they pick. Some are paid by the hour, but it's not very common. They don't have things like health insurance or sick time either. Those things are not something that comes along with being a farm worker. Now the Coalition of Immokalee Workers are um, the, they're an organization based in Florida. And what they've been asking for is a penny more per pound for the tomatoes that they pick. Now, that may not sound like a lot to you and I, it's just one more penny per pound, but they have found that just one penny more per pound for the farm workers has made a difference in the lives of the farm workers in Florida. So they have, you know, you can go to their website, you can see companies that have already agreed, but there are a number of companies, um, Publix, um, Wendy's. Um, they've asked for a boycott against both of those companies for not doing the simplest things to help the farm workers. And they are an incredible organization that has done so much 
for the farm workers by the workers making these decisions themselves and pushing forward these changes. Now, Food Empowerment Project, what we've done is um, we work on legislative changes. We've helped change a regulation that impacted the, um, the, the schooling of the children of farm workers to help their education. But we also do a school supply drive for the children of farm workers every year. And it's a thing that everybody can participate in. We're actually starting the school supply drive starting July 1st. We ask people if you can buy brand new backpacks and have them shipped to us, we would greatly appreciate it. Or if you want to give us money, we will buy the school supplies. This year, the, the school suppliers are going to farm workers who pick our berries, but they're also going to the farm workers. If you heard about the shooting that happened in an area in California called Half Moon Bay, um, it's also going to the farm workers impacted by that shooting. Um, those farm workers do mushrooms. Um, and that was a devastating situation where a farm worker so frightened and because of a fine that he was going to be forced to pay due to the negligence of the farm itself that he ended up turning on others. Um, and, you know, there's, it's never okay. It's never okay to kill anybody, but I think that we need to, to put the blame and the responsibility where that lies. And that's the farm um, for not training them properly. And also expecting a farm worker who, who basically made like $9 an hour um, to just survive um, to have him have to pay a, a high a high um, fee for a mistake that was due to their negligence. Um, one of the other things like I talked about before in terms of the conditions is that when these wildfires are taking place and you think out here, we have Sonoma County, we have Napa County, which are some of the really well-known wine areas in the country. Here you still had the farm workers being forced to pick in when the fires were taking place. So just to, to make it, we, our organization was based there at the time. You had an area where the county had decided this is so dangerous for people who live here, we have to call an evacuation. People were being evacuated, but the farms were still getting their farm workers to go in to pick those grapes before they were impacted by the fires. They were forced to water areas. They were forced to take care of, uh, in fact, they were forced to for the the non-grape farms, they were actually forced to take care of the, the animals as well, putting their own lives in jeopardy when these farm owners themselves did nothing. So again, when we talk about farm workers and how we treat them, um, it, there's so many different things. During COVID, you had farm workers who were still living in bunk beds. That's why we had some of the highest rates of COVID in Sonoma County, because the wineries were not doing anything to protect these farm workers. Again, we did our best. We gave them, we gave them food. You know, other than getting them school supplies that year, what farm workers needed were food. So we actually had food delivered to the farm workers themselves. So now I'm talking a bit locally in terms of the United States, which happens when we talk about food production, but I want to take us globally for a minute and talk about how our food choices impact others as well. And this is very important when we look at chocolate, because a lot of times people will say things like, um, the, you know, vegan recipes, they're cruelty free. And what we want to say to that is just because it's vegan doesn't mean it's cruelty free. If it's the hands of slavery or child labor, it is not cruelty free. And when you look at chocolate and where it's coming from, it is entrenched. Um, in fact, um, a new documentary came out. Um, that you can get um, called The Chocolate War. If you want to watch the first two episodes, the first one is called um, The Dark Side of Chocolate. You can watch it online for free. The second one is called Shady Chocolate. You can watch that online for free. Right now, The Chocolate War um, is, you have to pay for it. I think it's 4 or $5 to rent. But the sad part about these documentaries, they've been done over a period of time and nothing has changed. And it's because these companies think we do not care about what's happening for our chocolate. And we feel very strongly we need to push back and tell them we do care. We do care when the fact that children are being enslaved, adults are being enslaved for chocolate, which is a luxury. And I know some of us may feel like it's a necessity, but it's a luxury. Here you have children who come into it in a variety of ways. Children are often, um, they could be stolen from marketplaces. 
and they never see their families again. Sometimes they're sold into it because these children come from very poor countries um, near, say, the Ivory Coast or Ghana, like um, Burkina Faso and Mali, um, where there's such poverty there that they get sold into it by a family member. Other times the, the families think that children are going to be able to go to earn money and are going to be able to send it back and they're never seen from again. More recently, um, in Chocolate War, they, they interviewed some of the children where they said, you know, they were actually going, they were um, heading to the border and they kind of got, they said, oh yeah, we'll get you work. And they kind of confused them in the bush and they didn't know where they, where the child got disoriented and didn't know where they were anymore. And they're being trafficked hundreds of miles from their home where even where they're going, they don't speak the local dialect. Children like this, are forced to carry heavy cacao pods. One bag of cacao pods is about 100 pounds. Um, and if this, the children don't move fast enough, they're often beaten. Um, when we talk, you can see here, this is actually a Rainforest Alliance certified farm. You can see cuts on the girls' arms and legs from the machetes that they're using. A direct violation of human rights is the fact that they're using hazardous equipment. There's also chemicals that are used um, that these children are using. Um, what's, what's more harrowing we talk about, we're talking about literal slavery. We're talking about the fact that many of these children are locked overnight, and if they try to escape, they're beaten. What also is discussed in Chocolate War, which was also got some publicity when Hershey and other chocolate makers um, were sued by six formerly enslaved people about the fact that they were actually also cutting the bottoms of the children's feet open to prevent them from running away. And like the formerly enslaved person said, was that they were still forced to work though and their feet would bleed. So a lot of what I'm talking about is taking place in Western Africa. Um, but the problem is still taking place in countries like Brazil. Where a lot of times people say, again, you know, these children, when we find children, they're working with their parents. Well, first of all, they're not always, they're not telling the truth. But even if they are, like this cocoa farmer said, if I didn't have this rope around my neck, my 12-year-old son who works in the harvest would be studying. Just like the farm workers, the farm workers do all that they do so their children can succeed. This cocoa farmer is no different than any other parent. They want their child to study and go to school so they can have a good future. But what's happening is, is that the corporations who are truly at fault here are not willing to pay them, the farmers, a living income. So then they're forced to rely on their children. They're forced to rely on a system that enslaves people because these companies are not paying them a living income, a living wage, uh, I should say a living income for the work that they're doing. So what Food Empowerment Project has done is that we've created a list of chocolates we do and do not recommend. As Kim mentioned at the beginning, they are gonna be giving some of delicious FEP recommended chocolate away. Again, as a vegan organization, every company on this list has to make at least one vegan chocolate. This list is updated every single month. And um, we get those, the companies, by people reaching out to us and saying, will you look into this company for us? Um, it's available in English, Spanish, Portuguese, German, and French, I believe. There might be others. Um, we also have it available in English as an app to download. It is a free download. We have it for the iPhone and the Android. Again, if you look up a company, it's not on there. What will pop up is a screen that tell, asks you to tell us what the name of the company is and we'll reach out to them. So again, we need to tell the chocolate companies this is important. This app affords you that ability because on the app, you can reach out um, on Twitter and Facebook and you can tell the company either A, thank you for using chocolate that is not coming from where the worst slaves of child labor um, and slavery are coming from. Or two, you can tell them, why did you not disclose country of origin for your chocolate, which for me is one of the most reprehensible. These companies claim the information is proprietary, but keep in mind, we are not asking for the company that they get their chocolate from. We're not asking for the city. We're not even asking for the state. We are literally asking for the country of origin and they claim it's proprietary. The third thing you can do is if they are sourcing and we from a company, 
country that we do not recommend from or a, a company that we don't recommend, you can ask them about that too. Now, things are so bad in Western Africa that we have been told that even a direct trade for chocolate is not working in Western Africa. But what we do know is that there are some companies, there's a formerly enslaved person whose chocolate makes our list. There's a company in Cameroon that's going to be making our list on the next update because certain people who are from those countries understand what's been happening to their people and how their resources have been stole, stolen and they're trying to do it on their own now. And so those are companies that we do want to support. Now I'm going to switch to the last area of our work and kind of our like food justice and how we look at it. And again, this is a forum that we consider environmental racism, and that is um, food apartheid. When we're talking about the most impacted people who cannot access healthy foods, and that's black, brown, and indigenous communities. And again, this is an area that impacts Michigan. So you can see here when we are talking again, we're trying to use headlines because we want you to see how hard it is for people in Michigan, possibly even in your own community to access healthy foods. And again, primarily, again, it says the word Hispanic here. We do not use the word Hispanic at Food Empowerment Project. If anybody wants to ask me about that later, I'm happy to answer, but we do not use the word um, Hispanic at FEP. But basically, again, the point is, is that it's Black, Indigenous, and Latin, well, I should say Latin, brown communities are impacted by lack of access to healthy foods. And what does this mean for communities? It means a couple of things. One, it means that they are gonna have more dietary related diseases than people in wider and more affluent um, areas. It also means this impacts what they believe in. It impacts their belief and the world around them. We have done work, which I'll talk about, where we, you, where we had some students from San Jose State help out with the surveying work we were doing. And I had them check out Palo Alto, which is a very rich area, which you know, this is where the guy from Facebook lives, right? This is where all these wealthy Silicon Valley people live. They could not believe what it was like in other areas. They had no idea how well lit the stores would be, how they didn't smell. And this is how many community members, you may not even know what's happening in your community, um, but it happens all over the country. In fact, it happens all over the world because I've spoken about this exact issue in New Zealand where the Māori are impacted and the First Nations in Canada are impacted. So again, these areas, which we call food apartheid, a lot of people call food deserts. Um, we are part of a group that has decided that we're gonna call it what it is, it's apartheid. And I'm assuming that you all probably know what apartheid is. Um, if you don't, we can talk about it, um, but I think probably you all do. Um, but here, when we talk about food apartheid, we're talking about areas where you have more liquor stores, fast food, and convenience stores than you have in other areas of the community. So this is one example. This is in um, Vallejo, California, which is where we've done some of our work. And again, I always have to mention my bad photography is not because I'm a bad photographer, more that I wasn't supposed to be taking the picture and she busted me right as I took it and I told her it didn't happen. But this is what food is like where people get their produce in a lot of communities. They get it from convenience stores. And this is what their options are. Here you can see a couple of bananas, some onions, some potatoes, um, and this place is actually better than most. This actually has the prices. In our work, when we've done it before, when we surveyed in San Jose, they didn't have prices. So it was up to the person behind the counter how much they were going to charge. That could be depend on who the individual is, right? Maybe, maybe they have a, a problem with certain people and they're going to charge them more money. But it also means that people who don't speak English are at an automatic disadvantage from being able to find out how much the food costs. Now, this image is from a community that we're hoping to do work with. It is a farm worker community in an area, in a town called Alpa in California, which when you drive there, kind of satellite goes out. And this food was on the ground. And this is all the fresh produce that was available in this community. And this is for the farm workers who pick our food. This is the only fresh produce available at their grocery store. The next closest grocery store from them was a half an hour away. And it's one of those um, dollar stores. And again, not all the farm workers have cars. Sometimes they're trucked in, but this is what was 
available to the community. What you don't see in this is across the street is the most beautiful K through 12 school. And that's because that community invested money in the students and the kids and their education. But this is a community we are hoping to work in to turn this situation around. And again, many of you are familiar with what happened in Flint. Well, this community hasn't had clean drinking water for decades. Their water is so contaminated, they've only been drinking bottled water for a very long time. So what we've done, I should probably take a look at the time, but now I don't know where I put my phone. Um, Kim, can you tell me how I am on time? Am I okay on time? You're you're good on time at 7.08 and uh, feel free to go until, you know, or I'm sorry, it's 4.08. So feel free to go to 4.15. Okay, I'm gonna try to wrap this part up. Some of the things we've done is we've actually gone and we go in and we physically survey access to healthy foods in communities. Um, so we survey for um, meat and dairy alternatives as well as fresh canned frozen produce. You can see here, not surprisingly, that um, in the higher income areas, they actually had 14 times more access to frozen vegetables because in the lower income communities, um, the freezer sections were filled with ice cream and frozen pizza. And um, the low end communities, there was practically no access to organic produce. Now, that's not to say they didn't want it. When we do our surveying, we find out exactly that everybody's familiar with organic and wants it in their communities. So like I mentioned, we survey for meat and dairy alternatives. Now we don't only do that because we don't want any animals impacted. You know, We want people to do meat and dairy alternatives because that means no um, non-human animals are hurt, but also because we know diets higher in fruits and vegetables is better for people. But also we have this big issue looming over us. And that is the fact that the dairy industry is a legacy of colonization. We talk about the fact that instead of using the term lactose intolerant, which implies there's something wrong with black and brown and indigenous people because we can't digest the milk of another species, but instead it's normal. It's normal for us because it wasn't part of who we are, right? So putting it in my perspective, I'm a Hicanix, right? My ancestors are from the Americas. Columbus brought the cows over on his second voyage. That was not something that my ancestors digested. That's why we do not digest cow's milk well. It wasn't part of what my indigenous ancestors consumed. So that is why so many of us don't have this, right? We don't have, we are what we call lactose normal because it's more normal also not to consume the milk of another species. Um, so we see this again as a form of environmental racism when plant-based milks aren't made available in these communities. And so we wanted to make sure we surveyed it because it's important that we don't have families that have only an option of cow's milk that makes them sick because that impact also impacts, sorry, that lack of plant-based milks also impacts their children's ability to do well in school. Um, again, like I mentioned before, we did focus groups in the communities, paid everybody $50 for their time because it's important to compensate for knowledge in the communities. We fed everybody a vegan meal. We found out that some of the community members, their kids were actually vegan, um, even though they were worried about their kids, who, how they were going to eat because they needed vegetables. I'm going to try and speed this up. We found here um, one of the biggest barriers for people accessing um, healthy foods wasn't so much the ability the proximity, it was the fact that they simply could not afford the healthy foods. So we started pushing everybody working on living wages, whether it be city, state, federal, county, Walmart, McDonald's, whoever it is, we need to fight for living wages because we do not want prices of food to go down, uh, for produce um, to go down in the sense that farm workers aren't even being paid well as it is, but we need more equity. We need everybody to be able to afford and have that right that we, they should have to be healthy and to eat healthy foods. We also found that immigrant communities um, weren't eating very healthy in their communities because they were used to cooking with fresh fruits and they, vegetables, and they didn't wanna have to use things like tomato sauce. They were used to growing their own foods. We did this work in Vallejo as well, where you have, um, again, extreme, you know, more liquor stores in their community, less access to grocery stores. Um, in doing our work in Vallejo, we found that um, Safeway had located um, 
in a downtown area where seniors were living and black and brown community members were living, and they put a restrictive deed on their former property, preventing other grocery stores to move in. Um, so we actually have a national campaign. I don't know if any of these um, are in Michigan. I'm sorry, I should have looked them up. But they go under so many different names, and we're asking people to please sign and share our petition to demand that Safeway stop harming the health of communities. Um, for solutions, um, we see that people growing their own food is part of the solution. The food system has never been, was never created to benefit Black, Brown, and Indigenous people. In fact, it's been made to live off of our sweat, tears, and sometimes our lives. And so we want people off that system that has harmed them and instead grow their own foods, be independent. Now, for someone like me who's only ever lived in apartments, don't really have land to grow food. We strongly encourage worker-owned cooperatives where the workers are the owners and the workers are the ones who decide where their profits go and how they can best serve the community. Um, I just wanted to also mention um, our campaign against Amy's Kitchen. If you've heard about Amy's Kitchen, um, they do the frozen veg and vegan foods. Um, they have been treating the workers deplorably um talking they've been union busting the workers have um not been able to take their breaks they've had their um the exits uh, the ex emergency exits blocked off they've had um sexual harassment take place um and we found out recently that a worker slipped and fell and broke her arm there's a lot of workers who've had surgeries because of the horrible working conditions there um, we have information on our website. You can sign a petition. We also have stickers that we will send you for free. Just let us know. We will send you these stickers for free. And as you can see here, there's creative ways that you can get the word out. If there's a natural health food store in your area or a co-op, we would love to try to get them to stop selling Amy's product and join with others in standing for workers. Um, just real quick, the what you can do, go vegan if you have access to healthy foods, shop with care, Try not to support corporations that violate human and animal rights. We have on our website, you can go, we can talk about Coca-Cola, Nestle, Coca-Cola owns Minute Maid, all those other sodas that are part of them. Um, Nestle, companies like that, we talk about the reasons to not support them. Um, lend your voices to the farm workers. Choose organic when you can. It doesn't necessarily mean the farm workers are treated any better, but it means that they aren't being doused with agricultural chemicals. Use our chocolate list. Try to avoid using single-use plastic water bottles. Bring your own reusables. Buy local. If you have a farm worker market, we always encourage you to please support Black and Brown farmers. They have more barriers um, to their success. Support living wages. Um, we have more information on our website on bananas, coffee, palm oil, wine, and actually we just added avocados. Um, we have information about all of those on our website. Please speak out against food injustices with your family, friends, and newspapers, comment cards. Um, we have information about how to get involved on our website. We have a monthly newsletter um, if you want to sign up and just really spreading the word. Um, we are online. Um, we are on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and we do have a YouTube channel. And I hope I made it within my last few minutes and I haven't gone so much over, but thank you all so much for having me. And I look forward to answering any questions. Lauren, thank you so much. No, you didn't, you didn't go over it all. Your presentation was Fantastic. Thank you so much for talking so much in detail about the issues and also giving people um, concrete actions that they can take and solutions that they can take. There were some um, interest in the petition, so I did share the link in the um, chat uh, to your online petition about that. Um, uh, so thank you so much. And uh, oh, I do see there's a question on there. Um, is there any aspects of the Farm Bill that could help farm workers in the U.S. and California? So um, for people who don't know, the Farm Bill comes up every five years. It's a very massive bill um, and includes a lot of things. And so, yeah, we're interested in your take on how we may or may not be able to leverage that Farm Bill to support all farm workers. Yeah, I have not seen anything so far that will impact farm workers. What I would incur, I mean, this is just my personal perspective on things, is that the federal government is influenced by so many different things, and we know agriculture is one of them, right? And so we have more influence on our local and state governments than we do the federal government many times. 
Um, we have the ability to meet with our local offices um, and to try to get things changed in our own state, in our own city, in our own county. And so if there's anything that is can be done that's actually good for farm workers, we will absolutely post on our social media. We haven't seen anything yet, um, but it is important to keep an eye. And if there is anything that you all see in Michigan that's going on to protect farm workers, feel free to send it to us so we can amplify that and make sure other people know about it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing your perspective on that, uh, Lauren. Um, uh, Nancy put in the chat that it should be noted that non-dairy milks are more costly for, um, for, I'm sorry, Nancy, for example, regular home milk, local supply is at least a dollar less per gallon compared to non-dairy milk, in some cases, four dollars less. If non-dairy milk vegan products are offered in, in uh, food apartheid areas, the cost will still be a barrier to uptake stores. Um, stores offer foods which are likely to be purchased in high volume cost as a barrier in addition to access. So do you have any thoughts on how to make um, non-dairy milks more accessible or more affordable? Yeah, I mean, they are already. And I, I hear what you're saying, Nancy, but the reality is, is that they tend to like the non-dairy milks regardless of anything because they have a longer shelf life. So if you're somebody who can't go to the store that often, your milk's not gonna go bad that quickly. So in fact, that is something that they've actually told us they want because beside from anything, I mean, though a lot of them acknowledge, they know that their family members are lactose normal. I mean, it came up in our, you know, we did um, the focus groups in San Jose, we did seven focus groups in Vallejo, they know. And so to them, they were like, they prefer it just for this shelf life stability. And if they can go buy it in bulk, they can just keep it in their homes and it'll last a lot longer because they can't travel that easily to grocery stores. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I just wanted to go back that someone did comment that they appreciate your assessment of staying, trying to work on a state level as you're able. Um, we have another comment from Ethan, what are ways I can get involved or help support what FEP is doing? Thank you for asking that. Um, I think, you know, I will say as a programs person, <laughs> Um, always, if you're on social media, to please share our stuff. Um, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you can share our work, because we're trying, obviously, we want to succeed and we want to be able to do these things, but it's so important because so many people don't know a lot of this stuff that's happening. So I think really sharing um, this information um, would be uh, probably the best thing that you can do. Um, and people can get involved if you're interested in the Amy's campaign. Um, we have an Amy's campaigners list, um, so you can help us out. We're, um, our team has been putting together, especially Alejandra, doing an amazing um, video where we're actually talking and doing some interviews with the, the 300 workers, not all 300 we're talking to, but 300 workers were laid off by Amy's um, in San Jose, which is one of the most expensive areas in the country. Um, so we, we have like their gut reaction when this happened to them. So if you want to help out with that campaign, again, we have a campaigners list you can get involved in. Again, spread the word about our school supply drive um, for the children of farm workers. And of course, as you all know, we are, you know, we are a nonprofit, um, but I know Veg Michigan also needs your support. So I don't want to say financially support us. You should be supporting your local group, but always that's appreciated as well. Um, but spreading the word about our work is greatly appreciated. Well, we, we appreciate you saying that. And we're just, uh, I'm talking with my colleague here and we're saying that we're gonna stay in touch with you about how maybe we can support your uh, school supply drive. So oh, we might be able to promote great. that. Uh, oh, cool. So yeah, it's, Thank a, you. You know, it's an important work. And our farm workers, you know, it's because it's such a monopolized system, you know, those workers are helping to feed people here. So we have to be caring for workers everywhere. Every pistachio pretty much in the country, in practically even part of the world is from California. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for, yes. So I wanted to ask you, Lauren, because uh, I'm not sure if some people heard, but you know, recently there were um, a, a lot of investigations of child laborers in the food uh, industry. And we were just wondering if you had any thoughts about, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of states now that are trying to put bills to lower the child labor laws. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, we think of like child enslavement is just happening in, in other countries, but um, right here in the U.S., just as you said, children in Michigan, 
very young um, doing it, but now they're trying to pass laws so that it's not even illegal necessarily. So do you have any thoughts on how we can work on helping to protect um, the child labor laws that we do have and improve them? And you know, I know you did talk about that we need to increase wages so that adults can afford to do the work without you know, depending on um, children and their family to support them. Yeah, I mean, I wish, you know, it's scary actually. Kim, I have a blog that I'm wanting to write on this exact topic on how just revolting this is, you know, and how this new push is making us go backwards in every, I cuss a lot, so I'm doing my best not to guess, but in every capacity, it's pushing us backwards. And the fact that it's gotten so bad that we're once again trying to legalize child labor is just reprehensible. And the fact that, that these policymakers are going along with it, I think that every single policymaker should be held accountable for voting on this. Is there something big that we can do? I think it's a matter of voting. <laughs> I'm a very strong proponent of voting as somebody whose family wasn't allowed to vote, you know, and what my ancestors sacrificed to get us to be able to vote. I'm, and as a woman for both, I'm very strong proponent of voting. And again, that's why it's critical we get involved at the school board level, at the PTA levels, if you have children, because again, they're changing the what we can read in the schools too, right? Every level, we need to be more involved. And it doesn't mean we drop what we're doing, right? Like I always want to be clear. It doesn't mean we're dropping what we're doing for non-human animals, right? But your phone call, your letter, your going to one meeting can have a tremendous impact because I will say, not all of us, but most of us as animal advocates we have stood up to people telling us that we're weird, we're different, we're wrong. And we have a sense of self. We have a sense of um, the ability to maybe go to one of these meetings and call this out that maybe somebody who's there doesn't have the strength to do. So I always feel to some degree it's incumbent upon us that we be the one saying, hey, no to that book ban. Child labor, what are you talking about? What? are you really talking about when we're talking about child labor? Um, and so it's hard because they're doing it on every front, right? It's not even just agriculture right now. They wanna do it for everything. And so I think again, it sounds like, I, I sound like I'm not being helpful and I don't intend to not be helpful. It's just that I don't know, right? I know that we gotta not vote these people in office and I know we gotta hold them accountable. And I know that we need to shout from the rooftops when they vote for things like child labor. Yeah, no, I appreciate what you're saying so much. And it, it is a really concrete thing. You know, I think it's important to remember just what you're saying that we have to make our voices heard that when people are voting for these things, because like you said, a lot of people don't even know, you know, that these things. So when we know that these laws are being introduced, we have to let people know, we have to voice our opinion, who's passing them and then saying, hey, we want to vote for people who are, you know, really working for equity. So I think the suggestions you're giving are spot on. And, and <laughs> well, I thank and you so much. We vote them out of office too. To finish yeah. that, we vote them out of office. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so Ethan had a, another question. Um, should we email info at foodispower.org to get in touch? As, or are there other ways that we should be getting in touch? That's fine. I'm going to put my email address in here as well, in case anybody wants to reach out to me. Um, you can also reach out through our social media as well. Thank you. And so for anyone who can't see the chat, it's lauren at foodispower.org. Um, Thank you so much. And does anybody else have any questions? We just have a few minutes left. Um, so if you do have any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and then in the meantime, I just want to give another round of applause for Lauren. Thank you so much. We so appreciate your time today. Uh, your presentation was so powerful and impactful. There were people in the chat, in case you missed it, who were saying great presentation and saying thank you. And um, we are going to do our raffle now. So if anyone wants to be in the raffle, uh, you can just put a Y for yes that you want to participate. So just put a Y in the chat. And then um, I'm going to use a random uh, number generator uh, to select the, the winner. And uh, we'll get those equal exchange organic green jasmine tea out to you, as well as um, uh, Theo uh, organic chocolate, which is on the Food Empowerment's chocolate yes list. So um, yeah, if anyone wants to be in that raffle, I'm gonna give you a few seconds. You can put your, um, put your uh, Y just in the chat and then we'll, we'll um, call your name. And um, once you're the winner, you can email me at kim at vegmichigan.org 
and I will um, I will aim, mail that out to you. Kim, can I just, I want to thank you again, and I want to thank Veg Mission again. I think it's so impressive to me when vegan organizations like yours aren't scared by the idea of talking about how these issues are connected. And to me, that says a lot about this organization. And we absolutely would look forward to ways in working together because we know that you understand that it's not a, it's not a, the us or them, it's all of us together. And so not a lot of vegan organizations get that. So I think it's important to really thank you for that and, and knowing that you're not everybody is like that. So thank you. Thank you so much for saying that, Lauren. We really appreciate it. And uh, we really do value the work that you're doing. So thank you so much. And I also want to give a shout out to Alejandra, who helped to coordinate this entire evening. So I didn't say it at the beginning. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing and for coordinating this. Um, and again, Lauren, thank you for, for acknowledging our work. And we look forward to partnering with you.